Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Shepherd's Crook. I hope you guys are all having a great day today. I am excited to talk to a reoccurring guest now. I've actually had him on, I think this is the second or third time, so I think you'll be familiar with him. I'm talking with Chris Wiley again today. Chris, how's it going? Great, Jared. Good to be with you. Yeah. Well, let's go ahead and pray and ask the Lord's help, and then we're going to hear about your book, uh, the new book that you have that you've, that you've been, uh, been working on on risk, but let's first start with prayer. Okay. Father, I thank you for this time, and I thank you for a faithful brother and a man that I've learned from and so many have learned from. Thank you for all the men that have been inspired to get productive property, to walk with gravitas, all the things that he's been talking about for years, and you've used him in so many's life, just thinking through that kind of thing and those, those sorts of things. And I know that this category of risk and uh, talking about it can be uh, a difficult thing because we all want to be wise. We all want to be careful and, and take calculated risks and, and what, how much is a too much of a risk and and that sort of thing. And so just give us wisdom through this conversation. And, and as he continues to write the book, I pray that you would give him wisdom to finish that project. And uh, thank you for this time. I ask for a blessing upon it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. If you would, I'd love to hear a quick update. You, I know you're now living and, and moved cross country and now you're there full time. So how's the new work going? And I think uh, Nick Storm, I believe, is in your congregation. Uh, yeah, he's right. a, a gab buddy, but how things going in the new place? Yeah, Nick's great, uh, and his family's great. Yeah, the church is growing. Um, we're looking to uh, add staff now. Um, we uh, almost ran out of communion bread Sunday, so it's wow. kind of a good problem. <laughs> yeah. But it's at a point where I, I really don't know everybody anymore, and uh, it's kind of hard to, to to when you have like 10 to 20 visitors every week. So that's kind of where we're at. Yeah, great problems to have. I mean, that's phenomenal. What town is it? Well, I live in Battleground, uh, but the church meets in Vancouver. Uh, but uh, we use rented space, and uh, we're in the process of uh, developing a plan for another place to, to meet. Another, we're going to build a, a new facility at some point. But anyway, it'll probably be up here in Battleground when it's all kind of settled. Okay, gotcha. All right. So I heard some rumors about this new work that you're going to be putting together with New Christian Impress and to work on risk. And I've got some friends and I was talking to Brian about it, and he seemed pretty excited about what you've got and what you're putting together. And so I just love to hear about the work and what you've been thinking. And I know you've been thinking about it for years, but just bring us up to speed on this new work, the new book that's coming out. Just kind of give us an overview of, of what it's going to be about. Yeah, well, essentially, uh, the quest for a risk-free life is the riskiest kind of life you can lead. And if you understand that, then you just accept the fact that risk is part of life. Then the question is, is what sort of risks are the right risks to take? Um, so that that's more or less the framework for my understanding. I mean, years ago, my, my father-in-law, who's no longer with us, he went to be with the Lord, he uh, was laid off after about 30 years working for United Technologies, and he was actually one of their more talented engineers. Uh, he had been, you know, a child of the 50s and so forth and had bought into the safe, secure job with benefits mantra. And mm -hmm. he was one of the people who learned in the early 90s that that rule uh, was uh, not going to be honored anymore where that mm -hmm. promise wasn't going to be honored. And so he was, he was downsized and hired back at a lower, uh, as a consultant without benefits at a lower price, you know, that kind of thing. So yeah. it, it really, it really shook him. Um, and a lot of guys experienced that he wasn't the only one, but w what had helped to create is a, I think a, a reality check for a lot of people about, uh, the way the world works. So like mm -hmm. when you think about uh, a business who's the last guy to get fired the owner <laughs> yeah. he's the last guy to go right now if you're talking about a corporation then you're talking about maybe you know something different you know but if you're talking about just say uh something that is uh smaller in scale and is privately held then you know he's going to be the last to go so uh essentially if once you've ex once you kind of uh really let that sink in uh, it affects the way you look at the world, and mm -hmm. then the questions that start to follow is, well, what next? So, um, anyway, that's that's the nature of the of the project is just kind of helping guys think about that and and encouraging them to, to take the kind of risk that'll make it possible for them to own productive property. Yeah, 
phenomenal. You seem to be one of the kind of the few guys there's this growing divide has been for a while now. And I'm sure you're familiar with it of the younger guys and the older guys about investments and about revenue streams and the difference between getting a factory job, getting your pension, and then the world we find ourselves in today where you, you can't hardly find anything when you're 22 years old to go jump on board and, and have a career job. And uh, so you saw that pretty early on. What, what do you think differentiates you with the mainstream thought from guys that are generally your age, you know, that may be on the, the younger age of the baby boomers, but still have this very much this mentality. What, what, I mean, was it thrust upon you that you had to change and adapt or why why do you think there's still so many people ingrained in that older way of thinking that are counseling so many younger guys with counsel from 40 years ago, that's just not that effective today? Well, I think partly uh, it's the, it's the fact that I um, am the product of a broken home uh, that I think contributed to it. So a lot of a lot of baby boomers grew up in fairly stable world. Um, maybe you could say I was an early Gen Xer. You know, I, so I, I guess I'm on the on the on the border of those two groups, borderline of those two groups. And when I was a kid. Um, it was kind of the, uh, it was the sixties, early seventies. Everybody was looking for themselves and the, the self was always in California, very far away from your responsibilities. And mm-hmm. <laughs> so parents were, parents were just out to lunch. We didn't have helicopter parents in those days. You were pretty much on your own. So I was on my own pretty early and I learned to distrust institutional authority pretty early. And I don't mean, I'm, I'm not talking about just, um, you know, parental authority. I'm talking about just in, in general, uh, institutions that we're told we should trust. So I, mm-hmm. I didn't trust school teachers. I didn't trust psychologists. I didn't trust any of those people. And my, my, my distrust served me well, <laughs> you know, so I, you know, I, in the sense that, um, I felt it incumbent upon myself to take, uh, matters in my own hands as much as I could. Mm-hmm. I did, I wasn't disrespectful. I wasn't rebellious. Uh, you know, I don't want people to kind of take it to, you know, in those directions when they're thinking, but I just, I just knew I couldn't depend on a lot of these folks. Now, when I became a believer, um, I, uh, was given the grace to trust in God. So mm-hmm. it's not as though I, I'm just a person who can't trust people, uh, or God or anything like that. It's just, but I, but it, particularly institutional authority, mm-hmm. um, you know, the idea that I could just kind of hand my life over to large and personal institutions just seemed insane to me mm-hmm. over, over the yeah. years. So because of that, um, you know, I've taken matters into my own hands as, as best I can. And, and I've, wor- I've tried to work with large institutions when it's been uh, in my interest to do so. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's interesting because a lot of the Gen Xers who hated institutional power and structure and warred against it, it's the weirdest thing to watch a majority of them now be on board with the institutional oh, yeah. power. It's like green, you know, green day was right. talking about sticking it to the man. And now they're, you know, they're, they're like, far, you know, like pharma's their sponsor or something. You know, it's just the, it's the weirdest thing. It's yeah, just, they're, uh, well, they're frauds. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> come on. We need some, we need some good old rebels to come back, you know? Yeah. Well, that's, that's it. You know, I remember the hippies from the day, the hippies, we actually owe some, I think, uh, things to the, to those folks. One is, uh, they really believed. Now they had a kind of Rousseauian sort of way of thinking about the natural world, but they they were much more into sort of natural, sort of get back to nature stuff, mm-hmm. than all the weird pharmacolo- pharmacological or whatever you want to call it stuff today, where people are just being pumped full of hormones to try to be what they're not and all that kind mm-hmm. of thing. So uh, they believed in men and women, but they also believed. Uh, in small scale stuff so they were into like they were like the pioneers of homeschooling uh movement and it was uh christians who picked it up late you know sort of after they had done a lot of the initial you know heavy lifting uh, um particularly when it came to the legal side of it hmm, yeah okay so we think about the word risk immediately i think most people go to financial risk i mean that's what what they're thinking It's, it's most likely we're talking about finances and investments and how do you know it's a measurable risk and a good risk but but i'm assuming there's it's broader than just that i mean you just did move cross country that involves some risk so as you're thinking through that word and then the categories that may flow underneath that what were you thinking here let's let's i mean we'll get back to the financial side here in a little bit but was there is there more categories that you're thinking about or is that primarily uh, primarily what your your target was to talk about financial risk well i'll definitely be 
kind of putting that front and center, but you're right. It's, it's broader. I think it can, it can come as a surprise that, that sometimes uh, virtues in one uh, sort of sphere of life don't seem to carry over to another. So for example, you know, I've known guys who are physically uh, very competent uh, and, and are able to take risks when it comes to personal sort of physical safety but are extremely risk averse in other parts of life, hmm. you know, uh, when it comes to relationships or when it comes to, to finances or, and it can work the other way as well. Uh, so um, yeah, there are, there are a range of risks. I think that which, what you need in order to manage risk well is self-control and um, a, a sense of personal mastery. And when, when yeah. you have that and you can kind of manage um your fears, um, you're able to, um, you know, exercise discretion and, and be prudent, but at the same time, uh, take the steps that you need to take to take advantage for your opportunities. So, mm -hmm. and it, it's true for like, uh, personal relationships. So for example, a lot of guys, uh, are, you know, interested in a relationship with a woman. They want to, they want to, you know, for, you know, establish a household someday. And, but, um, you know, one of the things you have to overcome is your fear of rejection. Uh, what if that's going to happen? Mm -hmm. And a lot of guys uh, just kind of put things off. Uh, they employ strategies that just don't work, like the nice guy strategy. You know, um, we've heard a lot of great um, input on that subject. It, girls aren't interested in nice guys, <laughs> that kind of stuff. So uh, what often needs to happen is is you have to be up to the the, uh, to the to the challenge of actually approaching a girl that you that you find attractive and uh, able to deal with the possibility or maybe the even the the experience of being rejected and then just get up and do it again with some other girl you know what I mean mm -hmm. so as risk is just part of life and and you're right it you depending on where you are um, uh, and what stage of life you're in and in what sphere of life you're talking about, uh, yeah. you know, you're going to, you're going to deal with different kinds of risk. Okay. Well, just a personal question. I've got a lot of equity, uh, in our home and just been very blessed with, uh, the way we've landed where we've landed. We've got to build a few years ago and that happened by way of family money and generational wealth that was passed on. And so we really? were able to build, build our home. And <clears throat> I was talking to a buddy of mine and he's like, bro, I would, go out and I would buy like three cheap houses in our area in Southern Illinois. You can buy homes. You can pick up a home for $50,000. That's livable right now. And it's like, I just go buy three homes and do a little bit of work to them and Airbnb the heck out of them, you know, just mm -hmm. make some money. And we are, all, I've almost paid it off and mm -hmm. it's, I do want to pay it off. And then I've got some plans after that. And on the side, Actually, right when we get done talking here, I've got a guy that's going to be coming to rent one of our campers. So we we rent out campers and right. it's not taken off. It's just slow. It's just our second year doing it. But we just have two campers and we have one that we use for our family. And uh, so the, the, the internal wrestle, Chris, is that the, the whole idea that the borrower is the slave to the lender and the the Proverbs warnings about that. And I know there's a case to be made and people have made a lot of money in real estate by buying a house, improvement, improving it, taking out that money and going and getting the next one. And they've, I mean, there's a difference between, you know, good debt and bad debt. I get all that. And then this Romans 13, eight is just stuck in my head, you know, of, oh, no man, anything. So what kind of like, how have you worked through that? Cause I, I mean, I'm assuming as you're thinking through all that and, and been doing this for years that you've worked through that. So just, I just as some personal counsel, um, what, you know, what is the, the, the theological case for, you know, not being the slave to the lender and yet bringing on debt to make money? Yeah. Well, I think a couple of things to note. One is that, uh, different stages of life, uh, you know, uh, the kind of the prudent course of action might be different. So like when I was young and I had nothing, <laughs> you know, I wasn't in the spot that you have, you're in right now where you have some equity. I had maybe five thousand dollars in the bank, and uh, you know, I I, I took uh, I, you know I got a mortgage and bought my first two family and lived in one of the units. So it was a very prudent move at that point because I was already it was it's either that or rent, mm -hmm. you know. Right. So that was the basic choice. Um, 
now I'm in a different place. I own properties free and clear and, but I'm 60 years old. So I'm not like looking to like leverage those anymore. I'm like, mm -hmm. no, that, I, those are mine. <laughs> yeah, gotcha. I'm not going to do that anymore. But there are other properties that I, I am leveraged. Now, one of the ways to think about it is um, banks. And this is where I think maybe, you know, the situation on the ground today is, is dramatically different than the situation that is described in scripture. Banks borrow in effect from uh, the Federal Reserve. Okay. With their, in other words, they use uh, their own kind of leverage. So their deposits make it uh, possible for them to acquire the funds that they in turn lend to others. And then they have to pay back the Federal Reserve at a particular interest rate. Then they have their markup. So mm -hmm. that's why you know, the Fed, you know, overnight rate uh, affects our credit, but it's not direct. It's it's the, the intermediary. Mm -hmm. Now, we can argue about whether or not that's a good thing, whether we should have a Federal Reserve, you know, whether, it, you know, fractional banking is 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 moral. <laughs> the situation on the ground is what it is. <laughs> right. This yeah. Is, gotcha. The situation we find ourselves in. So, you know, unless we want to create an entirely separate economic sort of system that's fine let's you know that I'm, 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 I'm up for that conversation this is the way things work for businesses for you know home buyers etc unless you uh, are just working with what's known as you know hard money mm -hmm. which is money that's not uh, you know you know you know uh, created out of thin air by the fractional banking system um and you're not, you know, mortgaging away your futures. But when you think about it in the way I just described, when when you're dealing with a bank, so let's say you're uh, looking to buy commercial real estate. Well, your bank is actually your business partner. They're taking hmm. risk too. So okay. it's not as though they're um, just in a position of, of strength and you serve them. Hmm. Okay. You know, so now in your agreement with them, um, if you can't keep your part of the agreement, they have certain rights and they can take over the property. But right. believe me, they don't want to do that. The last thing a bank wants is is a is real estate. They 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 make their money on lending, not on managing. Mm -hmm. And uh, usually, when when real estate falls into their hands, they're trying to liquidate it, take it up, you know, take a loss, cut their losses, that kind of thing, mm -hmm. uh, because they're just not competent um, to handle that stuff. So I think that's a different way to think about it. That it adds a kind of new kind of a wrinkle that maybe um you know you wouldn't think of uh just use you know sort of appealing to scripture mm -hmm. yeah okay so in your life as you assess back over the years have you been in multiple situations then where you've made a decision and thought okay i could lose my shirt on this oh, or yeah. it could go really <laughs> well so is that is that what you're just comfortable with i mean have you been there i mean five times ten times or has that just been a way of living where you're just comfortable. It's almost like you're bet, you know, not in a weird way, but you're just betting on yourself knowing, okay, I can do this work and I'm trusting that God's going to come through here. Um, and then, you know, how, how do you differentiate that between that and, uh, and something that's foolish, you know, I mean, cause there's gotta be a line here where I could lose my shirt, but it's still not foolish. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, um, you know, the, the old adage, you make your money when you buy, not when you sell, you know, so if you have an eye for value, and you're competent. That's those are a couple of things that are really important in this whole thing. Then you're going to be able to uh, sort the, the opportunities out. Um, and when it came to my own, say, just real estate deals, um, I'd look at twenty properties for every one I, I would make an offer on. Uh, you just don't like take everything that comes by. You mm -hmm. know, you, you think about okay what what do i think uh is the upside of this so i i think that we're all we're always kind of value investors um one of the things to think about uh when it you know take taking keeping that adage in mind that you make your money when you buy not when you sell uh there's an ability that some people have to what i call see the money you quoting you know that line from said jerry Maguire or whatever show me the money you know that kind of thing. so if you have that ability to kind of see what other people can't see before it becomes obvious to everybody, then you you can get in when prices are are great. Mm -hmm. So like I think about like Apple Computer. Apple's started like in what the late 70s. You, you know, it, when it came out I didn't know about it, but uh by the mid 80s I was familiar with it because um you know, the Macintosh and all that kind of stuff. 
Uh, I don't remember what it was going for, but I probably would have thought it was ridiculously expensive, mm -hmm. you know, at that point. Yeah, and then, right. you know, in the mid 90s, I probably would have thought it was ridiculously expensive. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then in the early 2000s, I would have felt the same way. And it just has continued to go and go and go. Now, the reason why I couldn't see uh, what, uh, you know, you know, you know, how it would develop and uh, grow in values, because I just don't know anything about computers. Uh, I don't know uh, enough about uh, what's possible and, mm -hmm. and so forth. So that that was outside of my sphere of competence. But when it comes to, you know, real estate, I think I have uh, a much stronger basis uh, for making good judgments just because of, uh, you know, having seen enough properties kind of, and, and a lot of it's just kind of common sense, you know, is this, is this vicinity attractive? You know, is this a place that people want to live? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, will they continue to want to live here for the foreseeable future? Those kinds of things. So, you, you know, you're making uh, judgments about the way the world is going to develop. Um, you can obviously be wrong. Things can happen. <clears throat> um, but yeah, in the course of my own, uh, you know, sort of, uh, life when it comes to investing there were two or three times where i put it all on the line mm -hmm. yeah okay. uh, it worked out it worked out good <laughs> that's good it'd be a different conversation i guess if it didn't work out <laughs> right, right right uh let's switch gears a little bit and talk pastoral ministry most of my audience is uh, pastors who are listening in and certainly there's a broader audience than that but i started this as uh, basically to encourage pastors and what's the uh what is the uh, the profile of a pastor who is unwilling to take risks. What what are the negative consequences or the, the what's the case study of, of the guy that is risk averse? Yeah, I think a risk averse person is going to find himself at the mercy of the kind of the, um, of the opinions that may prevail at any given time with regard to, you know, his work. Okay. So um, there's a, there's a kind of an, a paradox at work here. I think people uh, are pleased uh, with the way things are going when obviously the church is doing well and it's growing. Uh, and one of the ways that that can be facilitated is when a pastor is competent and confident in the right way to uh, you know lead a church. It doesn't mean that he's got some kind of mindset that says, you know, my way or the highway or anything. That's probably one of the riskiest and the bad way and a bad way ways to kind of go about things. Mm -hmm. But um, so there's kind of a virtuous cycle that can kind of develop. And then there's also a vicious cycle that can kind of develop when a guy is uh, like got his finger to the wind all the time and trying to gauge the opinions of his pe people and so forth and trying mm -hmm. to uh, please everyone well, what actually ends up developing is uh, people lose confidence and, um, you know, in order for this guy to shore up uh, the opinions of people uh, when it comes to himself, he ends up doing the very things that led to the loss of confidence in the first place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you yeah. know, just always, you know, what do you want? What do you want? That kind of thing. So I think that's a very risky way of operating, but that's often how risk averse guys go about things. Um, when you say that risk is inevitable. You're taking risks one way or the other. So yeah. the guy that is not willing to address in a situation and instead just goes on to the next church, he's yeah. uh, unwilling to risk talking to this particular person who's the troublemaker yeah. or yeah. A, a, assessing that situation and then acting. But it's a risk yeah. to just continue to go on every two years to a new ministry as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Eventually you run out of people that are willing to take a chance on you. To, mm -hmm. you know to take a risk on you <laughs> yeah that's another thing to think about that when a congregation calls you they're they're also taking a risk mm -hmm. so what so okay pushback where somebody's like well chris it's yeah everybody's got to take a risk okay I, I concede to that point but wisdom would tell you that you know risk should be a rare thing that you're stepping into rather than this thing that is a regular part of your life where you're stepping out that and so what you're advocating for is just recklessness. So what's the difference then between, you know, between the two? How would you answer back somebody that, that came with that? Yeah, I think that, you know, risks can be evaluated. And 
You know, one of the things that I found helpful from the Sim Nicholas Taleb and his uh, his his writing on the subject of risk is he had this thing he called the barbell. And whenever you take a risk, the there should be something a counter is a counterweight, uh, something that's less risky, more, I guess, uh, uh, sort of reliable that you can fall back on. It kind of works like a cantilever. So, like if you think about, uh, say, a deck that extends from a from a from a house or a building that has no visible means of support. Well, there's mm -hmm. support, but it's deep inside the structure. You know, th things are tied in way back inside it. So, um, when I would take the risks that I took, uh, so let me give you an example of one of them. Uh, so, I bought a, a, a 16 unit apartment complex uh, years ago. And I had to, I got three mortgages to do that. Okay. <laughs> it was sort of like an all out kind of thing. I, I was, right. I was with my mentor. I don't know if I ever talked about this with you before, but I was with my real estate mentor and he was kind of the, kind of the, the kind of the grandfather of real estate in central Connecticut. And I said, Hey, I, I'm, I'm ready for another two family. And so we looked at two or three and he, and he after like the two, second or third one, he, he turned to me, he said, you need to go bigger. Okay. I said, yeah. really? So how big do you think? Well, how about 16 units? I said, really? <laughs> and he, then he took me over to take a look at this place. And I thought, okay, I think I can make this work. Mm -hmm. I get another mortgage on my house. I get another mortgage with the bank. And then he lend, <laughs> he loaned me from his own personal uh, funds, $87,000. Okay. So I had, so, you know, all of these, all this, but I got it at a great price. Uh, it was uh, back in, uh, 2001 or two. So right, right. after the, the 9-11 thing mm -hmm. and uh, everybody was scared to death. And I looked at the to get the property and I thought, I mean, it's, it's already uh, at a discount, a huge discount. So um, I think this is going to work out. And it did. And I ended up selling it like four years later and made a lot of money. But okay. I see. Um, yeah, I got out before the crash in 2000. Yeah, good. Well done. <laughs> But at the time, it just seemed like completely nutsy. Uh, but the, the things that were the counterweights were uh, the property itself. <clears throat> That's one of the great things about real estate. You know, is you mm -hmm. have an asset uh, that uh, so long as your community doesn't become Detroit, it's going yeah, to right. it's, it's still have uh, value. And then, um, you know, in terms of my personal relationships, my wife uh, uh, was... Uh, really solid through the whole thing, very supportive. I've got a, a uh, an unusual situation in the sense that my wife comes from a family that it does has done a lot of investing in real estate. So for okay, her, gotcha. this was like normal. This is okay. sort of like yeah. life. <laughs> yep. It wasn't yeah, that's, like a big thing for her. That's good. And that's what I was going to ask. So the guy that's on board with this, going to read your book and say, yep, um, I realized that I have been taking risks by not taking risks. And now I'm, I want to take some risks that I'm somewhat in control of rather than being dragged along in life. I'm going to take the bull by the horns and let's, let's get after it. <clears throat> but the wife is there. doesn't come from that family background. How do you coach or, you know, how do you lead your wife through those difficult conversations? Who's thinking, wait, honey, you're, you're taking out, you're going to take a mortgage out on our paid off home. And right, right. What, what are you going to do here? Uh, right. So how do you do that and assess, okay, how to coach up and lead your wife through that process? Yeah, I think a couple of strategies. One is um, you you try to uh, give your wife a security blanket. So I think you know one of the things that's helpful is if your wife has uh, direct access to some funds that uh, that are hers to to hold on to. Okay. Um, you know, I I know that when it comes to a household, uh, you know, one of the things I stress is that we're you know we have a common life and common wealth and so forth. But you have to be also realistic in the sense that when you're dealing with with people in your household, um, it's important to um, do the best you can to allay their fears mm -hmm. and not just sort of like make them feel guilty for feeling that way. Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes guys make the mistake of, don't you trust me? You know, and then it put her on a guilt trip and she kind of goes along with them, even though she's got some pretty serious reservations and some fears. And uh, she might really trust you, but at the same time, this is just brand new territory for her, yeah, and right. she's not sure uh, how this is all going to work out. Um, so uh, in a situation like that, if you can allay her fears by saying, okay, hey, babe, uh, this this little stash of cash over here, 
it's got your name on it. You're the only signator. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, the, <laughs> yeah. Whenever you feel a little nervous, just go look at that. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> just stuff, something like that. Uh, and take and take your wife's fears also to heart and say, okay, am I really thinking this thing through? Mm -hmm. Um, what is the kind of the 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 game plan? So if you if you have like, okay, this is if this happens, babe, this is what we're going to do. If this happens, this is what we're going to do, mm -hmm. you know, and, and she can ask you questions about, okay, plan B, plan C, then plan D is we live under a bridge in a box, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Are you okay with that? <laughs> yeah. And then we, now when you're young, you can start again too, you know, let's say you're in your twenties or thirties. I mean, there's still a lot of life ahead of you. I didn't buy my first property until I was 34. Okay. Yeah. That's helpful. All right. Now let's talk worst case scenario. There's a risk here and the guy has lost a shirt and a lot more. And he's thinking, man, you know, he bought, bought in in 2007. And, yeah. <laughs> and, and uh, so counsel to that guy. Yeah. I think that, you know, you need to regroup. Uh, you can heal it just, you know, you know, like you're physically, you physically, you can heal after a real traumatic event. Um, you know, physical harm and, and, you know, economic harm and, sort of emotional and all these things uh, need to be addressed. And, and then it's, you know, kind of getting back at it uh, mm -hmm. and trying to get back into the game as quick as you can, I think is, is also a good thing to do. Um, try to learn some lessons, uh, say, I'm not going to do that again, yeah, <laughs> that particular right. move. Uh, that was, that was, a, that was a bad move. That was, that was dumb. And then, you know, talk to yourself that way. And then, maybe take a few calculated small risks to kind of get your, your game going again and your confidence back and take it from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause I mean, it seems like almost anybody that has wealth and that's done it the right way at some point has a story when they were 38 and they made a real bad move and it went really bad and it almost took them out, but yeah. then they kept going. So for, uh, for pastors, most pastors have a retirement going, some kind of match program. I think our church does too. It's a, it's a match program in my retirement. Um, but we're thinking long term. So I'm this year I'll be forty, and I'm thinking already. And both my parents retired in their one retired retired in his he, my dad early fifties, my mom a little bit later. I'm wanting to keep working, and I mean anybody. I mean retirement doesn't mean not working. I'm going to be working forever. Right. But right. but uh, but formally at some point I'm going to need to be there. Uh, is property the best way for people to have some income, retirement income, or I, I know there's a bunch of different ways, but is it the most accessible, uh, well, or it, what else could be really accessible? Well, I think it's accessible, but it's also got the benefit of, uh, you not cashing it in. So like when you think about a 401k, you know, and when you start your drawdown, you're losing, you know, equity every time you draw on it, mm -hmm. uh, with regard to say rental property. Um, the asset still is there. Um, and if you're uh, at, able to keep it in good uh, repair, uh, very likely it'll continue to appreciate even as you're drawing income from it. Mm -hmm. And then there are all sorts of tax um, benefits to owning property that you know about. Um, so I think for that reason, it just makes a tremendous amount of sense. Um, you, in order to be good at it though you need to, a few things you need to be able to assess property well uh take the risk uh, of acquiring it when you when you when you do have an opportunity to do so then you need to be able to work with people obviously your tenants uh you got to be a good judge of uh, who's trustworthy and who's not you know got to mm -hmm. know how to screen uh, and then you also need to know how to work with the physical property itself doesn't mean you have to do all the work yourself, but at least you need to, to know what needs to be done and, and when to do it and, and have the wherewithal to get it done, you know, that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Yeah. That's good stuff. Well, for the sake of time, we're going to wrap things up, but I want to go ahead and let you just tell us about uh, the publisher. We got, I got my friends that are pub working with you to publish the book and I want to give them a shout out, but also just tell about your podcast too, and where people can find out more information about your books. I've said it before, but uh, man of the house. I've had a lot of guys at the church read it. It's almost like there's a cult like following to it, like a, like fight club or something like that the movie, <laughs> where, where people get it and they start talking about Mr. Shoe or their productive property. I'm like, Oh, you're talking productive property. You've read C.R. Wiley. Um, but tell us about your works and where we can find more information. 
Well, of course, I'm on Amazon and stuff like that. And I'm looking forward to working with the new guys at New Christendom Press. This will be the first book I've done with them. Um, I've been published in, you know, magazines in different places. Uh, two or three of the books that I'm I'm known for are with Canon Press. Um, and I love those guys. So that's kind of a little bit about all of that. Um, in terms of the po- the podcast, uh, the, the Theology Podcast is now in 60 countries. We've got about 10,000 regular downloads from different platforms and stuff. So it's kind of grown in a way that just kind of astonishes us. And, uh, but if, if that's, that's, just, that's probably the best way to keep up with uh, what I'm doing, because I mean, I've got, I do have an author uh, website page, but I never visit it. I, never, <laughs> I only update it when I have another book, Okay. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's in uh, every once in a while, I'll, I'll maybe put up an interview, uh, that I'm on, you know, when I'm interviewed, you know, put, put it that there, but I haven't done it in years. So anyway, uh, probably the podcast is the best way to stay up to speed on what I'm working on. Awesome. Well, thanks a ton, guys. You've been hearing from C.R. Wiley. Uh, Brother, appreciate you coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was was a fun conversation. Good deal.